Hi, my name is Alex Dolphin and welcome back to another episode of Exanti. Today we're going to discuss the case Broadcast Music versus CBS. This case started in the Supreme Court of the United States in the year 1979. Let's go ahead and jump into the facts of the case. So know about what's going on, we need to know a little bit about the parties. CBS, we all know it's a TV station. BMI, we might not know. Um, BMI is basically an organization of, of musicians where they group themselves together and then they license their music to other organizations. So maybe to bars, to stores, or to TV stations like CBS. So BMI and ASCAP, is the, are those, those are the two defendants in this case. They're both essentially guilds of artists that come together and you know provide a blanket license of all of their copyrighted musics to customers. So what that means technically is, you know, say there's a hundred artists um, and CBS wants to get one artist, they want to get the rights to one artist's song, right? And to play that on um, one of their TV shows. Well, to do that, they can't just buy that one artist. They can't buy the rights to that one song. Rather, they have to buy the blanket license from BMI. So they're getting rights to you know hundreds of songs that they're never going to play or use. Um, and so CBS is mad about that. And so CBS sues BMI and ASCAP under Section 1 of the Sherman Act, saying that this is an illegal restraint on trade. This is price fixing. Uh, it's tying. It's exclusionary. Um, it's monopolization. They're basically throwing everything at the wall. But what the court is dealing with here um, is whether this is price fixing or whether that's illegal per se. And so the district court says, you know, no, this isn't per se price fixing. And the appellate court says, yes, this is per se price fixing. And the Supreme Court basically comes back and they say, you know what, district court, you're actually right. This isn't per se price fixing. Um, and so to develop the reasons for that a, a little bit is what's important here. Um, so traditionally, you know, the, the text of Section 1 of the Sherman Act says any restraint of trade, right? And so what is, what is that going to mean? Um, it, are we going to say that any types of agreements that are restraints of trades are going to be illegal under the Sherman Act? If that's the case, lots of contracts are. And so generally the court has taken an approach where they say any reasonable restraint of trade. Um, but even so, there's some things where like price fixing, we know, is just going to be per se illegal. Generally, that's what people think, right? And that's what CBS thought going into this case is if you can get someone on the hook for price fixing, well, then you're going to get them on the hook for violating Section 1 of the Sherman Act. And so there's, you know, different types of price fixing that we might think of. You know, the first would be, you know, say we have Sundar Pichai and Tim Cook and they are shaking hands and saying, you know, we're going to sell our, you know, iPhone 13, our Google Pixel for the exact same price. Sound good? Yep. All right, cool. We'll sell them both for eleven hundred dollars. Well, that's price fixing, and that is illegal per se. Price fixing, right? That is just an overt, naked restraint of trade without any business justification. But the court is saying here, you know, not every type of agreement or to set prices or anything like that is going to be subject to the per se rule, and so they're carving back that per se rule. They're saying, you know, here. We gotta look under the hood a little bit. We gotta look at this business instrument and see what it really is doing and what it's really you know, up to. And so they're saying, well, okay, let's look. Are there some pro-competitive justifications for this, you know, this blanket license that BMI is issuing, right? And so the first one they say is, yeah, you know, it kind of gets rid of the free riding problem. In a sense, you know, you could have bars, you could have um, stores that just play one person's song and if they do that, it's going to be really hard for that one artist to go around the nation and, you know, try and say, hey, you can't play my song. You're violating my copyright. So it does. When you have this guild of artists, you know, there's a, it's a larger, more powerful group and they have more ability to enforce, you know, their copyrights. OK. And then two is it really does solve a negotiation problem as well. Um, if you're just one artist and this is just kind of the other side of the coin of the free writing problem, if you're one artist. And you're going to, you know, try and sell your song to, I don't know, Payless is gone now, but say Payless, you know, I'm sure it was around in the, in the 70s. If you're trying to sell your song to Payless, well, it's going to be hard to do that, right? It's, there's just different negotiating leverages that aren't going to work as well. Because you're going to say, all right, here's my song, you know, pay me $100 for the rights to it. And they'll say, well, we'll just go down the street and pay someone else $50 for the rights to it. But when you have this big group, you know, you have much more negotiating power. And so it does kind of respond to some economic inefficiencies, this blanket license agreement. Um, is it good? Is the blanket license agreement all good? 
I don't know. I think that's subject to a little bit more debate. But what the court says here is, well, we're just going to say that it's not a per se violation of the Sherman Act. Um, we are going to consider the economic evidence. We're going to see if there's pro-competitive justifications that um, BMI can bring forth and kind of rebut this, you know, presumption in a sense that this is, you know, going to be anti-competitive. And if they can, then maybe we'll say it survives a rule of reason analysis. But that rule of reason analysis is just going to be much more comprehensive. It's going to be a large, you know, um, inquiry where we are actually looking at economic evidence. Whereas if you know CBS had won and uh, the Supreme Court had upheld the appellate court's ruling, which says this was illegal per se price fixing, all they would have had to have shown is that these people did agree on price, and that's really easy evidence to introduce here. Um, and so that's you know kind of where you see that there's this per se rule of reason and that this you know dichotomy essentially. And you know if you can get into the rule of reason, you can argue your way out of something generally. Um, but what it really is interesting about this case is that you take something that you think would be per se illegal price fixing and the court says you know even if it does look just a lot like price fixing we're still going to kind of look at the economic evidence before we just condemn it and so that's you know one of the key takeaways from this case is that it really is carving back the per se rule and expanding our rule of reason inquiry um, in antitrust justice stevens writes a dissent where he just says you know what Okay, sure, I agree. This should be under rule of reason analysis, but we don't need to remand that to, to the lower courts to do. We can do that here. Um, we have enough evidence. You know, um, BMI basically it was CBS was asking for individual license and licenses, and BMI was saying no, you can't do that. And just in a sense of this is kind of tying, um, it's a tying of products, which is you know kind of a more section two monopoly claim. Um, but even so we could condemn this arrangement here in the Supreme Court and we don't need to send it back down to do that. Um, so it's an interesting case. Uh, thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you'd like to see more, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and I hope you have a nice rest of your day. Bye-bye.